Testing. One, two, three. Hello. God, I don't use this thing enough. Hi. So, I got a 3D printer yesterday. Or rather, I technically got it on uh, January 1st as a gift to myself, basically, because I graduated. And it's the Prusa i3 Mark III over there. And I gotta tell you, it's absolutely amazing. Within 19 minutes of taking it out of the box, I was able to get started with a bunch of, well, things that I've been catting and thinking about for a while now. I haven't really been making as much as I had been in my sophomore or freshman year because just haven't had time to go to the makerspace on campus. But the one thing that I've found particularly interesting, just as a thing that I noticed for 3D printed designs, is that people are absolutely terrified of trying to fasten things together with 3D printed fastening mechanisms. and. That's not really to say that people don't use compliant mechanisms properly or snap together designs or just try to usually 3D print a monolith if they can avoid if they can 3D print a monolith. But what I mean is that the concept of the threaded fastener is something I always see just out of metal, right? Like if you're thinking about what it takes to pr to 3D print an assembly of something, not necessarily a part, but a an assembly of parts. It's always the 3D printed stuff and then it's the fasteners and the threaded rod. It seems like everyone who owns a 3D printer also has just this bucket in their garage of nuts, bolts, and McMaster car gift cards, right? And so one thing that I was thinking about for a long time was, okay, why why not 3D printed clamps, uh, just, you know, spring clips, sir clips, all matters of stuff that would usually be used to fasten things together in macro assemblies. But, like, the... Just a nut and a bolt was the first thing that came to mind. And the first issue that I noticed with the nut and bolt is that tons of people, at least on Thingiverse, for example, they're doing it, and they're like, well, there's issues with it. The, the, first and, the first and most significant issue with trying to print a nut and bolt is that the only way to really try and print those threads with still unacceptable draft angles, but you can pretend they're not unacceptable, or at least try and maybe file the support material out, or uh, just hope that the bridging can do its job, but people will print these fasteners, like, vertically, and then they'll be like, okay, it works, then they'll print the nuts, and that will work a little bit not, at, not as well, but then they'll still have it, and they'll put it together and be like, okay, it works, but printing them in that direction defeats their purpose. I one really good maker I saw on YouTube was referring to how well he basically made a 3D printed vise and he was thinking about how you would design the vise and then he basically said okay so you have threads this way and you can't load them in tension because it's 3D printed you'll split the layers apart so you need to load them in compression and I'm just thinking this whole time the job of a nut and bolt is it's not necessarily sheer maintenance and whatnot that's what a shoulder pin's for it's for uh, tensile force inside the bolt. It's for pulling on itself to compress two other things together. That's kind of what a nut and bolt is for, and by any sacrifices that you would do to make it 3D printable by printing it vertically defeats the functionality of the thing you're trying to print, and that that's silly to me. That's very you know, I would buy a 3D printer before I buy a CAD software type of thing that I would think of, you know, where like <laughs> You're going to defeat the purpose of the thing you're printing just so you can print it. That's silly to me. And so basically what I was doing was I was thinking of ways to make things 3D printable. And there's kind of three revelations that I... Well, first off, I made this basically. Or rather, this was the first prototype. Here's the second one. The lighting's terrible here. But I'll probably pull up 3D models for the video and just talk over those. But basically... What you're seeing here is that it's a bolt, but it's not a whole bolt. You only really need a little bit of the bolt so you can print it this way, flat. And if you're loading things, uh, uh, you're printing in this direction, if you pull in that direction versus pulling the layers apart, it's significantly stronger. And the other interesting thing here is, other than the, uh, well, let me just run down the, the revelations I had to have to think about, or nothing's original but the thought process I had when I was making the model of this trying to optimize it for strength and printing and all that jazz and doing a bunch of annoying math to determine the thread the unique thread form because this is a custom pseudo custom thread form I pulled it out of the tw I don't know if it's in the later versions but the 20th edition of the machinery's handbook is where I actually found it 
Uh, let me actually open up the page just so people don't need to hunt for them. Okay, look at this. Arrow thread. Arrow thread. For, I had never heard of this. I tried Googling it and I found a bunch of companies that sell this product but not a lot of technical information on it. And it's only in that one table but basically that's the thread form geometry for into extremely soft materials. Meant for a helicoil, a brass insert of sorts like that or maybe a, a, a copper winding or a bronze winding or something like that. I don't know but basically I've got that thread form figured out. You need something that's kind of trapezoidal and I'll open up the CAD model in a minute or two. But basically, you, you chop it off so that the draft angles work out. Not the draft angle of the outer diameter, but the draft angle of the inner diameter of the thread. That was kind of interesting to figure out. And then the other issue that I had was, okay, so that's, sure, that's the nut, that's the thread form. Well, I haven't gone into detail about that, but eh, I don't make these videos a lot. I'm bad at this. The other issue was the nut. How do you make the nut? You can't, you know, it's an, it's an external part. And so I, I had the simple thought of, okay, hexagons are an extremely easy part to print, at least piecewise, until you get to the top. So why don't you just split it in half? But yeah, just split it in half is, was my first... Actually, no, that, that was my first thought. This is the... This one that I have, the one that's all hexagon-shaped. I'm bad at this. Uh, that wasn't my first idea. My first one was just a relatively far simpler to CAD, far simpler to hold together way of doing it, and it was just um, like this. Oh, get my fingers out of the way there. Versus this. Whereas this was the old one. And the reason why this was the old one and why this one was the issue is because I wanted a spring clip around it that was elliptical just because I knew that was a friendly and strong shape for some compliance so it would be easier to push together so I wouldn't need admittedly a lot of prototypes to get this final one ready. And mind you, I got my printer yesterday so a lot of prototypes, these things are small and if you know how to tweak your settings properly, I'm able to toss out an entire one of these nuts in maybe 25 to 35 minutes if the settings are just right. Prusa controls um, printing settings and whatnot let you have variable uh, layer heights as it goes along so that that was really 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 helpful because you can just make it so that when there's a thread when there's like a thread you have high resolution and when there's not you don't need it but anyway um we know not that for the other one but anyway uh the thread form i'm babbling enough so the way that i figured out the thread form and i'm probably just going to pull it up in solidworks here okay so basically, here's what it is now. Or at least let me just roll back a bit so I can show the thread form. So here I am in SolidWorks. Uh, 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 let me just roll this back. First off, the equations. Par doing this parametrically. Wait, shoot, the equations don't mean anything unless I show it to you. Cool, here we go. So you got the diameter, right? And that's just, uh, uh, that's what that is right there. And then, okay, why why are you copying a body? Is that you'll 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 see. But um, just sweep the helix along. That's basically the thread profile. The pitch. I tried doing quite a bit of math to get the pitch just right, but it's kind of arbitrary right now. Um, I tweaked it until it was approximately equally spaced because the math I was doing to figure all this stuff out was getting pretty ugly. Um, here's the prototype of. The space, wait, no, hang on, that's not the prototype. This, I can't see whether or not you can see this or not. Here's the prototype of the spacing equation, followed up by this, uh, uh, yeah, this one right here. And then it ended with uh, this abomination right there for the uh, uh, lead angle. But yeah, so I was screwing around with the math, but I couldn't get it to work to not break itself in SolidWorks. So I was just playing around a little bit more. Um, just, I was going around modeling, 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 but the thread form, right? Let me show you that. The thread form is basically just a standard 90 degree profile because I know with certainty 45 degrees is usually an acceptable draft angle, at least for hollow, for small overhangs like that. But the trick was coming to the realization that for this cut, on the uh, the bolt, 
that's not a small overhang like the threads, like the individual threads were going to be. So I wanted to worry about this a lot more. And so the way I made that cut was basically on the inner radius, on the inner race, because that, the smaller one, that's what the actual steepest draft is. And I can actually show that to you here. Let me just do a draft analysis real quick. Oh, I couldn't find it, yeah. There we go, see? So if, if you're looking at this right here, you'll see that you can't just do your overhang calculation based on the outer diameter. You have to do it based on, you see? Look at that inner diameter right there. And it passes it there. See that? That's the angle you need to be thinking about. And let me just point something out for a second here. So I'm going down the draft angle right there is it says it's about 53 degrees. And in my equations right here, I list, oh wait, hang on, a draft of 30. So 90 minus, that, that should be in the infinitesimal. That'll go down to maybe 60 degrees instead of the 53, which is what it was measuring right there. But basically, uh, uh, if you just look at it, you'll see that in the sketch, 60 degrees right there. Oh, and that may, okay, so yeah, that's kind of weird to look at, but it's be between the tangent line and the uh, uh, horizontal radius vector right there. But yeah, so that's the screw, the nut. Now, the nut was a lot more difficult and a lot more interesting as far as I'm concerned. So I was scaling everything down, uh, making bodies and stuff. All right, so the nut, how do you end up making the nut? Well, it makes sense to split it, all right? And I ended up splitting it with the front plane right there so you could put it together in two parts. But, you know, how do you hold it together? Because although you don't really think about it this way, when you torque a nut, there's force vectors that are pushing outward against it, um, you know, trying to pull the nut up. If you split a nut in half and you try and just load it anyway, they're not just gonna, they may stay together because of friction and whatnot if you're not loading particularly hard. Um, but there's a reason why nuts are usually just one integral part or whether machined or anything like that. Or if they're not pointlessly large, they're not cast or anything. You, you want the homogeneous piece of metal for strength purposes. At least I would assume from what I've read. But basically, I uh, uh, needed room to have a retaining ring on it. So basically, you put the two parts. Let me make sure that, I can, that you can see this properly. So you basically, you put the two parts together like that. And then you have a ring that goes over it and holds them together, like that. Or at least on the prototype, this it was elliptical like this, because elliptical, well, there's more length over it, so it can spring a little bit more. I, I've got a whole other design folder full of spring clips and fastening and whatnot that I want to prototype now that my printer is finally, well, existing. But basically, the final way I thought of doing it was I knew I wanted something that you could put a wrench around, and you can't put a wrench around this annoying elliptical shape. So basically, I realized, okay, cool, why don't you just do this, I thought, until I realized, oh, crap, you can't print that. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can't print that. And let me show you why. See that right there? You can't, That's you need support material for that, and that completely, as far as I'm concerned, the art of designing for 3D printing is kind of designing to not need support material. If you're needing to file something, it makes it not a manufacturing process anymore. It makes it a crafting process. That takes the... Pr no, it's not a good design if you can't manufacture it. You need to craft it, right? That's kind of part of the... Pardon me, engineering bias. A fresh undergraduate wet behind the ears engineering bias talk in there. So I was like, okay, wait a second then, wait a second. Why does that need to hover in the air? Can't that just go all the way down to here? And then I was like, well, no, because then you couldn't fit a wrench at it if you put a retaining ring around it. So then one other minor leap of, uh, well, first, let me get, get out of there. I'm not talking to you. You don't need all three faces. You can just use the retaining ring as the torquing thingamajigamahu is what's it? Hang on, wait. Okay, so I was still doing fitting last night when I got too tired to keep going. Eh. Still, tolerances are... T okay, there we go, there we go. 
Haha! Like, and wait, so where's the, uh, there we go. See that? No, you do, I'm just, I'm just, I, I have the cat software right here, I'm an idiot. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the trick right there. <laughs> See, because you can just, you can shove a wrench around it like this. I think I had, um, about an inch right, oh yeah, by tolerance, you know, that's a little bit less than an inch, so you can still put a one inch wrench around it. The nuts are always going to be bigger than they would normally be. Just because, you know, something was going to have to give. It's 3D printing. You either need to make it too big, too weak, too exotic, too many parts, or too much work. They're done. Ha-ha! Breaking news. Eh. little tight because well you know I haven't worked these in yet and what and what less than 14 hours of printing stuff and I'd already have functional prototypes yeah sure but that's a good printer anyway works I haven't tried any clamping failure mode tests or anything like that or even a comparative test between whether or not printing vertically or rather I know it has a difference but how big of a difference printing vertically has over printing horizontally and doing it this way but by my rough calculations, the strength that you lose um, by not having as many threads engaged and not having as much of a cross-sectional area in the ball hole should be very easy to make up by the fact that you can have deeper threads like this with a slightly more aggressive pitch because the coefficient of friction of this plastic on itself is really high, so you don't really need as steep of a as many threads per se because the point at which you would achieve shear failure which is the reason why you have so many of those threads is so you can distribute the shear forces along the length of the bolt before you would reach that yielding point for this 3d printed part you would reach the force at which the layers separate so if you mitigate that in theory you should be able to deal with losing a lot of that cross-sectional area you know that would have been bearing tension load just to prevent the layer separation I don't know. Tell me what you think in the comments below about this, but I had a lot of fun doing this. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching.